Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this another Lord's Day. We thank Thee for Thy Word. We thank Thee for these men that Thou didst raise up to stand for the truth and against the lie. We pray that Thou wouldst cause us to uh, be enlightened through their understanding of the truth and through, of course, Thy Word itself. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. We are now at chapter 21 in the confession of religious worship and the Sabbath day. Now, we dealt with Christian liberty the past couple of weeks. Now, Christian liberty and liberty of conscience. Now we are dealing with not the Sabbath day so much as the fourth commandment, but the worship itself, which takes place on the Sabbath day. First paragraph, L. All right. The light of nature shows that there is a God who has lordship and sovereignty over all, is good and does good unto all, and is therefore to be feared, loved, praised, called upon, trusted in, and served with all the heart. Uh, and with all the soul, and with all the might, but the acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself and so limited by his own revealed will that he may not be worshipped according to the imaginations and devices of men of the suggestions of Satan or the suggestions of Satan under any visible representation in any other way not prescribed in the Holy Scriptures. Okay, so it's interesting the way they put the first part of that statement that man knows by what they call, what is the term for that? Natural, Natural revelation. Natural. What Kennedy. we can know and what man does know about God apart from the written revelation of scripture. And what do they say that man does know, even apart from scripture? Hold on, what does it say? And even apart from scripture, God's creation reveals that there is a God who rules over all his creation, sir. Yes. Um, so that's an interesting statement as far as think of and, and the thing that man doesn't do which which is another proof of our depravity and that's that though man does well that takes us to um, get one out where's my Bible Kelly is it still up there on the desk let's turn to uh, Romans 2 which is a misunderstanding, a misunderstood passage. Beginning with verse uh, 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness in their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So, even those without written revelation are responsible, and yet, what would be the most natural thing for you to do? Accountable? If, what's that? Responsible or accountable? Yeah, both. What would be the, what would be the most natural thing for you to do if you 
if what they say is true, that there, that even the light of nature shows there's a God who is sovereign. All right, how would a person know that from nature, Elizabeth? What would you think? I think it's obvious how people would know there's a God. Such an amazing universe that we live in. But how would it be that nature, the light of nature, would show God's lordship and sovereignty? What would you say about that? That's what they say. Light of nature shows there's a God and a God, not just a God, a God who has lordship and sovereignty over all. Well, the heavens declare His glory. I mean, just looking out, and you see the stars, and you see that the earth is. How about, how about we speak of the what? How, how about the the order? That's what I'm thinking of. We we talk of what is known as the laws of nature. The laws of nature are not commands that nature is 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 under obligation to obey. No. What do we mean by the laws of nature? Natural. What we mean is that, that just as you were saying, the order that is inherent in nature. Natural. What? Life. And, the, and the, the, that's not, they cannot be an act, just like this, all of this stuff couldn't appear by itself. Where it says, there's a God. There has to be a creator. And secondly, the, the, the fact that it's in such perfect order also shows a rule of God. God rules in the universe. Lordship and sovereignty is good and does good unto all. Now, how would we know that, Calvin? Through nature. Huh? All the provisions. You think of yeah. You think of. Creaturely, what do you call it? Right. That God, the providence of God in passages such as what did we read last week? Psalm one hundred four. Yeah, didn't we? We began our service with one hundred four last week. How God provides not only rules over creation. In the order that is inherent and obvious, but verse ten, he sendeth the springs into the valleys which run among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild asses quench their thirst. By them shall the fowls of the heaven have their habitation, which sing among the branches. He watereth the hills from the chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of thy works. He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man, that he may bring forth food out of the earth, and wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengtheneth man's heart. And so we see that God is not only, that there is not only a creator, God is not only a God who is sovereign and rules over his creation, but that he is good. As we see that he provides for all of his creation. And um, so at the end of the chapter, as we pointed out, it says, let the sinners be consumed out of the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless thou the Lord, O my soul. So, man is the only part of nature which is um, rebel. Yeah, exactly. Rebels <laughs> against God. Does good unto all and is therefore to be feared, loved, Praised, called upon, trusted in, and served with all the heart and with all the soul and with all the might. All of that man knows from nature. Think about that. So what would be the na most natural thing, response to that? Maureen, what, what am I getting at? You understand? I'm not sure what you're getting at. 
if, if God has provided all of this, then I would want to know God. Exactly. Who is he? You would ask the question, who is this God? Has he told us what he requires of me? Since he rules me. That's the thing about antinomianism. How can the antinomians possibly say that God doesn't rule? And since they can't deny it, then, then, okay, so the next question is, what does since he rules, what does he require of me? Does he require something different of you than he does of me? Well, then what would that be? That would be chaos, chaotic. And so, but what does man do? Not only does man not ask the question, what does this God who is so obviously present and rules and is good, how do, how do I thank Him? How do I worship Him? What does He require of me as a creature? No, man does not only not answer that question, what does he do? All day. He refuses even to ask the question. No, he, he was refuses to acknowledge. Uh, and and we have passages such as uh, what is it? Psalm fifteen. Fourteen. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They're not just ignorant. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Fool in scripture, we've said time and time again, is rebellion, not ignorance. So man rebels against this light of nature. So... Uh, but the acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself and so limited by his own revealed will. How is it that we are to worship God? That he may not be worshipped according to the imaginations and devices of men or the suggestions of Satan under any visible representation or any other way not prescribed in the Holy Scripture. Try to tell somebody that there are, I mean, think of something as logical as this that there are still Ten Commandments. They're going to argue with you, right? I mean, why would it be reduced to nine? And if it's reduced to nine, who said who used to say that there are seven instead of nine? What is the one they get rid of first? Sabbath. The Lord's Day. Yeah. So, and that's why this chapter... Or they twist it. And that's why this chapter is entitled Of Religious Worship and... Sabbath day. Why do you think that's added to it? Armin. Of religious worship and and Sabbath day. Because they go together? Huh? It's telling us that God has not only told us how it, well, he when? is to be worshipped, but when. When was it? It wasn't too long ago, although it's now it's been quite a while, maybe 20 years ago, that unheard of before that. Worship services on Thursday night. Thing. Remember that? Well, there's still oh, there's tons of people do that still. No, that's what I'm Calvary saying. That, but before that, I never heard anything like it, except the Seventh-day Adventists, which is to say that we, we can worship God whenever we want to. Second paragraph. All days are the same. Maureen, number two. Religious worship is to be given to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and to Him alone, not to angels, saints, or any other creature, and since the fall, not without a mediator, nor in the mediation of any other, but of Christ alone. Okay, so the first thing, we are told is that remember when um, Christ is tempted of the devil mm -hmm. and the devil says if thou be the son of God 
cast thyself down. And and what does the devil say? I mean, what does Christ say to the devil there? All day. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Religious worship is to be given to God, and not just we are to worship God. This is really interesting. Well, not only to God alone, but is to be given to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So, God tells us that He is to be worshipped as one essence in three persons. In other words, He's to be worshipped in the way He has revealed Himself to be God, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what do we have? The, uh, the first commandment and the second commandment. Both the, for what's the similarity between the first two commandments? Elizabeth, have you thought that through? The first commandment is what? Elizabeth, Thou shalt not have no other gods before me. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And the second commandment is what? Thou shalt not make an image. Alright, so the similarity between the two is what? The same? Because what, what, what's, what's, what's similar in the first two commandments? They both deal with what the manner of worship? What would you say, Al? Both the first and the second commandment, the similarity between the two is they both deal with worship and... and well, the uh, first four deal with worship, right, our relationship right. to God. Right. But the first and the second, they both deal with... Right. I don't say it. Idolatry. Mm -hmm. With the object, more specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, so, mm -hmm. thou shalt have no other gods before me, and the second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. And the difference, that's the similarity. They both deal with who is to be worshipped, and the, but the difference, Elizabeth, is what? It's interesting how they fit together, the first two commandments. The first commandment tells us of the object specifically or more directly who is to be worshipped and the second commandment he is, is not to be worshipped. How is how yeah. he is to be worshipped. How is to be worshipped. And which tells us if God is not worshipped in the way he has prescribed to be worshipped we're worshipping a different God. Right? Mm -hmm. A God of our own imagining. What's that called? Idolatry. Idolatry. Right, it was, and it's also called presumption. That you worship God. Oh, I can do this. Uh, wait, can you? Yeah, Are you? Did God? Did God prescribe that? What's that? Like, that it presumes that God didn't fully give us. Everything. Huh? Oh wow! Yeah. That He left something. And presumes out. that He's going to accept our worship. Because no, he He's left, not going to accept it if He didn't prescribe it. Because He left something out. Because you're worshiping a different God if you worship in it in a way that he has not commanded to be worshipped. So, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And him alone. Now, that's the positive. The negative is what? Tell me. You are to worship God in... Worship God and God alone in three persons and not... What? Any other creature? Any other? What does he say? Read it. You looking at it? Read the second paragraph. Tell me. Just worship is to be given to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and to Him alone, not to angels, saints, or any other creature. And since the fall not without a mediator, nor in the mediation of any other but of Christ alone. Alright, so the negative aspect is what? Not what? Adding to any other... Yeah, not to angels, not to saints, not to any other... So we see once again, as we've seen in the past, that this document was not written in a vacuum. What do we mean by that, Al? 
Well, that these folk, these uh, men were the Holy Spirit uh, was giving them guidance and instruction from God's word. No, but wait, but he's see, he's speaking specifically of of specific violations of what he's talking about, not to angels who worships angels, huh? huh? Roman the Roman Church, yeah. saints, the Roman Church, yeah. or any other creature. Yeah, should, but it is not. The Lord that God be, in Him it, only. In their Shout time, it used to be the Roman Catholic Church. Now it's everybody. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it's a principle being set right, forth, right. but they but they were speaking specifically mm -hmm. About the concerning oh, yeah. the the aberrations in their time. And since the fall, and since the fall, that's interesting too. Wow, mm -hmm. the way they Always. worded that. Religious worship is to be given to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and Him alone, not to angels, saints, or any other creature. And since the fall, what changed about the fall with respect to the worship of God? You see it, Maureen? You see what they're thinking about here? Now, before the fall, did Adam and Eve worship God? You better believe they did. But what? But they walked didn't need, They didn't need a mediator. Since the fall, not without a mediator. And uh, I remember still to this day you know, when I was in uh, Taiwan explaining, hey, first of all, you ask them the question. These guys have been regimented. And uh, at the end of my, we pray before class every day. And at the end of the prayer, in the name of Christ. And so I ask them, what is, what, why do we pray in the, in the name of Christ? Why do we pray in the name of Christ? Clueless. And at the end of the prayer, everybody says, Amen! In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen! And so what is that amen for? Why do we pray in the name of Christ? What's the significance of clueless? What, uh, what's the reason why we pray in the name of Christ? All name. Because we cannot approach God without Christ. So right. Because we still have and, remnants of sin. And we're reminding us. ourselves at the end of our prayer that there is no access to God apart from a mediator. Right? Paragraph 3. All name. Why don't you read that one? Prayer with thanksgiving, being one special part of religious worship, is by God required of all men, and that it may be accepted it is to be made in the name of the Son, by the help of the Spirit, according to His will, with understanding, reverence, humility, fervency, faith, love, and perseverance, and if vocal in a known tongue. Required, prayer is required of all men and that it may be accepted it is to be made in the name of the Son by the help of the Spirit and in accordance with His will with understanding, reverence, humility, fervency, faith, love, perseverance and then vocal in a known tongue which does away with the charismatic idea but interestingly enough Oh, that's even before us, they existed <laughs> Well, apparently they had people like that at this time. Oh yeah, Could they it did. Possibly be the Roman church service writing prayers in Latin, which the common people don't yeah. understand. There you go. Good point, yeah. And then vocal in a known tongue. So good point, Holiday. So in other words, at the time the the priest was praying to God and and what was wrong with that in Latin. Huh? Nobody understood him. Okay, nobody knew what he was doing, what he was saying. Maybe he didn't even know. Maybe he was faking it. Who would know? But it also says prayers to be made not only in the name of the Son, notice carefully, by the help of His Spirit. What does that refer to? Look at Romans 8. It's probably, I don't, these verses are in Chinese and I can't, if I struggle through it, I can find out what they are. Romans but, 8, 26, sir? Yeah. That's one of the verses. Oh, is it? 
Well, then let's look at Romans 8. Let's see if that's the one I'm looking for. Exactly. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And so, we pray in the name of the Son, by the help of His Spirit, according to His will. And we think of the shorter catechism question, what is prayer? What's that, Reynolds? Prayer is an offering of our desires up unto God. An offering up of our desires. Okay, say it again. Prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God for things that are agreeable to His will, with confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of His mercy. You left out something. Prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God for the things that are for things that are agreeable to His will. In the name of Christ. So, but the first thing, prayers and offering up of our desires in God, for what? For any old thing you want? No. For in things glory. that are agreeable to His will. Because if you pray for something that's... So, so what do you... So what is requisite with respect to a person who's praying? Uh, Maureen. God's will. Right. And, and, and the longer you, you discover, the longer you're a Christian, the more you are able to pray with understanding. And you can tell the level of a person's sanctification through his prayers. What's he praying for? How does he pray? Does he know what to pray for? And how do we know what to pray for? By knowing who God is. What he's command what it what he has promised to bestow unto his people, etc. By the help of his spirit, according to his will, with understanding, reverence, humility, fervency, faith, love, and perseverance. And once again, if vocal in a known tongue. Paragraph four. Hmm. Elizabeth. Prayers to be made for things lawful. And for all sorts of men living, and for that shall live hereafter. But not for the dead, nor for those of whom it may be known that they have sinned the sin unto death. That's interesting too, right? The last part of it. Nor for those of whom it may be known. That, hey, that's that's interesting. You don't usually think about that, do you? What, what are they saying? That according to their, their at least their can, understanding, can, can, there are certain people that you know. No, no, yeah. Or you may know. It doesn't make you judgmental. And so you don't pray for them. No. I, no. Oh. I'm telling you. When you look at the at Christ in uh, Matthew Twenty twenty six is it? No, it's twenty it's twenty three, right? Matthew twenty three. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. What's he saying? If you do this, then it's going to be bad. No, 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 no. Woe unto you. This is your latter end. Eternal woe. For ye devour widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater, da the greater damnation, won't you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass the sea and land to make one proselyte. He, no, he, he didn't preach the gospel to them. He denounced them. So, this is very sobering, is it not? For all sorts of... The, hey, that's interesting. What's that a commentary on? First Timothy 2. That's what I like to ask people. Uh, we know there's a common 
misconception of 1 Timothy 2, 4, right? Look at 1 Timothy 2, 4. Read that all day. We will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. All right. What's the common misconception of that verse? That God Anybody. desires the salvation of every single person on this earth. Every single person, head for head. What do they say? Prayer is to be made for things lawful and for all sorts of men. So, once they make the word all universal, um, which is to say every single individual, then I just ask them, did you pray for a... Uh, <laughs> I said, my, my wife's sister, did you pray for Shiyas yet? Lately. And then I said, what are you talking about? Doesn't he, doesn't he, uh, he will have all men in, in, in the very first verse of the chapter, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayer, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Well, then you're sinning if you didn't pray for that person. It doesn't mean every single person had prayed. It means what? What do they say? All sorts of men. Right? And he gives us an Calvin is helpful on this. He gives us an example. What is his example he gives us? Verse 2. Al. Well, for kings and all, for all in authority. Yeah. And, and, and Calvin. He's had to and be. Calvin says, Calvin says, the reason he mentions kings is we tend to think that, that these guys, God saves so few of them. Right? Isn't it, this, isn't it so? We, we, we tend to think that those guys are. Beyond, Jeez, no. <laughs> right? Beyond hope. No, he says, for kings, even for this type of person, even for this sort of men, for kings and for all that are in authority, they tend to be so wicked that you would think there's no hope for them. No. So he says, for all sorts of men living, for all things lawful, and what would that what would that tend to indicate? Maureen. Well, if you're praying against what the Bible speaks of. Yeah, suppose somebody says that that, that, that pray ask God that they would sing um uh, they would sing in such a way as to duly honor mother on no, no, no. <laughs> on on Sunday in their anthem to mother. Uh uh-uh, uh, ain't gonna work. Prayers to be made for things lawful and for all sorts of men living. There it is again. This wasn't in a vacuum. They're speaking of the Roman church where they pray for what? For that shall live hereafter. Shall live hereafter. What are they getting at there? What? What we were talk? We were talking about this morning in the worship service Christ about the fact of God's saving his people in the line of continued generations and so you're married n- newly married newly weds and you pray for your progeny that you hope that and that's a, a prayer in accordance with God's will that you're praying in accordance with will that he prays in your instance that he gives in your instance he produces his people by your union. Or that shall live hereafter. But not for the dead. Not for people who have already died. Why? Hebrews 9.27. What is that? It Al. Established for man wants to die and then the judgment. Yeah. Is it appointed? It is appointed. Read that. Calvin. So what does that have to do with praying for the dead? The, the Roman Catholics think you can pray somebody out of purgatory and into heaven because they believe in purgatory. So when you die, you're kind of floating around for a while, but you can get out if enough people are praying for you. Really? Enough? Oh, yeah. yeah. You, you, you need there's you a, like a number. You need a certain amount because it depends how good or bad you were when you were here. And I'm serious. But you can make so many prayers and then fling their soul to the heaven. And they really believe that. Really. 
But if you don't where have do time to get well, all these people, you can buy I mean, obviously, they must have cracked that from some <laughs> read that in their mind from something in the Bible. How do they do that? Well, no, it's all connected to the concept of salvation, salvation being of the church. And you're dependent on the church, see, to get yourself out of purgatory. It's all fear-laden. So, but back to the last part of the statement. For those of whom, not for those of whom it may be known that they have sinned the sin unto death. And so, since Christ doesn't pray for, doesn't preach the gospel to, but denounces the Pharisees, here's a question. Have they disappeared? They're people I don't pray for because I believe they're Pharisees. They're the religious leaders. They are recalcitrant. They're leading uh, people into destruction. And they've done it for years. They think with impunity, but they're going to find out it's not. Paragraph 5. Whose turn is it? Al. Al. The reading of the scriptures with godly fear, the sound preaching, conscionable hearing of the word, in obedience unto God with understanding, faith, and reverence, singing of psalms with grace in the heart, as also the due administration and worthy receiving of the sacraments instituted by Christ are all parts of the ordinary religious worship of God, Beside religious oaths and vows, solemn fasting and thanksgiving upon special occasions, which are in their several times and seasons to be used in an holy and religious manner. Okay, Nehemiah 8, verse 8. Regarding the first part of the paragraph, Nehemiah 8, 8. So they read in the book, of the law of God distinctly we were talking about that sermon we were listening to earlier today by a, an Armenian preacher who read distinctly that you, you give that guy that much he didn't stumble over words and if you asked him he would tell you why he didn't stumble over the words because he would tell you it's the word of God but that's only part of it they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. The Puritans, if you read any of the Puritan writings, you'll see toward the end of whatever sermon they're preaching, they will say improvements of the text. Improvements meaning what? How can you improve on perfection? Works. Huh? huh? No, it, it's, it's, it, well, it's, it refers to application. And so they read in the book of the law distinctly and gave the sense. And so according to scripture, it's not enough just to... Some people preaching that's a running commentary on the verse. No. They were read in the book of the law of God distinctly. They gave the sense and they caused them to understand the reading. How can you cause a person to understand? You can't. So that doesn't mean that you're effectually... Uh, your, your, that your words are working effectually in somebody's heart. No, it means what? It means exhortation. It means use of the word therefore. I preached a sermon one time on that one word, therefore. The importance of the word therefore. Why is therefore important? Elizabeth, what do you think? What? Is it behold? Like... Therefore means... Based on the above teaching, how do we then live, right? In light of these principles, how do we respond? So that's preaching must include exhortation. The use of the word therefore. And Paul, the Apostle Paul is the past master at that. Read the book of Romans, how many times he uses the word therefore. Therefore also tells us what about God, all day. It also tells us that God definitive. is logical. Right, so he's so rational. And definitive. Yeah, therefore, since this is what he 
requires of us, how do we live in light of that? Singing of psalms with grace in the heart. <laughs> we were listening to uh, Gerstner's. As we said, Gerstner has a series of videos on the Westminster Confession. We were watching his video last Sunday night on this chapter. And you remember what he said, Holly, about the Psalms? Um, Gerstner said he. So, so why yeah, well. Him? Correct. Yeah, right. yeah, why, why pick him up on the road when well, on the, so, the Cadillac? Who can figure it out? Yeah, who can figure it out? It, it makes no sense. Right? He says, I'm not going to advocate for exclusive psalmody, but the majority of, of things that we sing should be the psalms. But as a result of that, yes. that he actual take. Exactly. He's pushing the envelope. He's saying. Uh-huh. Yeah, so, so first of all, he asked the question once again to avoid, what are we just talking about? A little leaven. To avoid presumption. Yeah. So give me one reason why you would sing something that's inferior. Why would you deliberately offer something to God which is not the best by your own, by your own admission? Wow. Yeah, that's... And then, he, and then he gave an excellent illustration where he said he was attending a worship service where the choir sang an anthem huh? on... On uh, uh, Matthew 25, where you've got the, the sheep on one side and the goats on oh, the yeah. other, and they sing, Come, ye blessed of my Father. And that was a whole anthem. And so he said, he went up to the, what was the choir director afterwards, and said, uh, what was it he said? <laughs> I can't wait to hear part two. <laughs> I can't wait to hear part two of that anthem next week. And the guy said, "What do you mean, part two? That's all. That was all. That was all of it." He said, "Well, I was expecting to hear about those on the left, the goats. What's going to happen to them? What, what's his point, Pauline? What was his point? His point is that hymns they don't talk about Christ's judgment. They right. they primarily talk about good. the good. Psalms yeah. include the whole gamut of Christian experience in our worship to God." Receiving the sacraments, all parts of the ordinary religious worship of God, etc. Paragraph uh, 6. Neither prayer nor any other part of religious worship is now under the gospel, either tied unto or made more acceptable by any place in which it is performed or towards which it is directed. But God is to be worshipped everywhere. In spirit and in truth, as in private families, daily, and in secret, each one by himself. I'm not sure what exactly. I guess you would have to be more familiar with the... you see anything in that, uh, Maureen, that, that uh, the Roman church... I'm not sure what specifically he's re- they're referring to there. Could it be the... Possibly the Roman church taught, yeah. if you pray at your home, that's that's good. But if you pray in the church, now that's much better. God's going to really hear your prayer. Right. Yeah, and they definitely did buy for that. Yeah, well, there, because of the words, is that even, either, either tied unto or made more acceptable by any place in which it is performed or towards which it is directed. Towards which... It is directed. But God is to be worshipped everywhere. In spirit and in truth. As in private families daily and in secret. Each one by himself. So once again you see the tendency. And as I like to say. That the Roman church doesn't have a monopoly on implicit faith. What do we mean by that? Al, what is implicit faith? Remember? Oh, yeah. Implicit means, you know, uh, it's expressed and one accepts it and believes implied. Implicit means implied. Yeah, implicit faith meaning the idea that you, um, 
you believe, uh, if you say, it's sort of like, and, and that tells us what, what direction we're moving in. In the heathen lands, I used to ask, uh, in, in Taiwan, I said, so what, what do you, uh, what's your religious persuasion? And the guy would say, woman shin fu. So we, we believe in Buddha. He ne- they, would nev- they never say, I believe in Buddha. They say, we believe in Buddha. And then the next question I ask is, what, <laughs> to which there was never, never, ever an answer. What do you believe about Buddha? She's That's not Buddha. engaged. The mind isn't engaged. Implicit faith. The Roman Church. What do you believe in Roman Catholicism? What do you believe about... Same church. Same whatever church, the, whatever church. my church believes. What when, does the church believe? We went to Austria and we went to a Catholic church. We were still going to Catholic church at the time. And the whole service was in German. But I knew every... He's going to do this now. He's going to do this. Because every service, it doesn't matter where in the world it is, is exactly the same. Wow, exactly that's interesting. The same. Yeah. And, and I mean, it would now, so how many now? The Lord suffered with it. Exactly the same. Very strange. Yeah. So, I believe... <laughs> what do you believe? You got... Don't you have a brain? I believe what they tell me to believe. What is it possible that they might be wrong? I mean, after all, how frequently do we read in Scripture about the deceitfulness of sin? Hmm. So, but what what we say is that the Roman Church doesn't have a monopoly on implicit faith. You go to the church where we were attending. Ask these people, how is it possible for God to desire the salvation of men? He has determined. From the foundation of the world, not to save. The that's free, that's the insanity. Sense, the preacher said so. Exactly. That's it. And I mean, after all, and uh, what what is First Timothy, First Timothy three fifteen? Study to show this. Well, first, Pe- uh, first Peter, excuse first me. Peter. First Peter three fifteen. What is that, Armin? But remember, isn't that it? First Peter three fifteen. What? What is that? But sanctify. Sanctify the God, Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is within you with wow, meekness and fear. A reason. Which is your reasonable service. Who people to go don't want to talk about religion. See, and so, as in private families daily and in secret, each one by himself. See, the the church, as it becomes a more and more hierarchical, it begins to take over everything. And you are dependent on them to know, even though, even though nowadays they don't, they no longer speak in Latin. Basically it's the same thing, right? They speak over people's heads. That's why I was saying this morning, what was that? The Johannine. We've got to make four syllables out of one syllable. That, that's no accident there. These things must be explained. Like somebody saying, Oh, uh, something like uh, irresistible grace or a limited atonement is, is misleading. No, it's not misleading. All of these terms, whether it's the Trinity, it has to be a God, one God in three persons. That has to be explained. It's not misleading. Limited atonement isn't misleading. You would be amazed at how many people don't like the, don't like the phrase. Limited atonement. It's not difficult. It's not an error. I like it myself, personally. What does it mean, limited atonement? All day. It means Christ died for all and only those whom the Father gave him. All right. It is limited with respect to its object. Christ's atonement is limited to... All, as you said, all and only those that the Father gave him. What's difficult about that? What's objectionable about that? We said, uh, everyone who's 
uh, calls himself a Protestant, believes in a limited atonement. And what is that? Hell. You either limit, as we just said, the extent of the atonement, limited to those the Father has given to the Son, not one more, not one less, and not the what? How do, how do other people limit? What is, how does the false gospel limit the atonement? We limit the extent of the atonement. What do they say? It's limited to, not to the extent, but to the amount. Close to its efficacy. Right. Okay. Yeah. That they say that Christ died for all men. However, and when you ask them, so are all, that's the first thing they ask them. These guys with the billboards out there at the football games. Did Christ die for all men? What are they going to say? 100%, not 99%, 100%. Of the, yes. So everybody's going to be saved and go to heaven, right? Oh, no, 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 no. So what are they, what are they saying? It's limited in efficacy. It's not. Effic- it's only efficacious in su- in certain cases. According to the would you and would you be a would you be an exception to the rule or would you be part of the yeah, rule? It's only that, yeah. It's a, it, it. Only people go to the heaven go to heaven for whom Christ died who do something with that. There it is. Limited in efficacy, which is blasphemy. That Christ's work is not effectual. All right, paragraph, where are we? Seven? Maureen. As it is of the law of nature that, in general, a due proportion of time be set apart for the worship of God, so in his word, by a positive, moral, and perpetual commandment, binding all men in all ages, he had particularly appointed one day in seven for a Sabbath to be kept holy unto him, which from the beginning of the word to the resurrection of Christ was the last day of the week, and from the resurrection of Christ was changed into the first day of the week, which in scripture is called the Lord's Day, and is to be continued to the end of the world as the Christian Sabbath. As it is of the law of nature, that in general, a due proportion of time is to be set apart for the worship of... What are they saying there? That man knows that God is to be worshipped. Hey, if he's to be worshipped, he's got to be worshipped sometime. So in his word, by positive, moral, and perpetual commandment, binding all men in all ages, looks like they knew what, they knew what was coming down the track, Right? By a positive, moral. What do they mean by that? Positive, first of all, that, yes, he set apart a certain time. Moral, meaning what? That the fourth commandment is a moral law. Just as much as, see, that's why, that's, the reason given frequently for saying that the, that the fourth commandment is no longer in effect because it is not part it's, it's not something such as thou shalt not steal thou shalt not commit adultery is not related it is not a moral injunction and yet they say what? it is by a positive moral and perpetual commandment I remember when I was in seminary back in uh, the early 80s, there were what was known at the time blue laws, which was, what were the blue laws? You remember, Al? Yeah, you couldn't sell store. liquor during... No the- stores open on Sunday. Uh-uh. Blue laws, and then they, they, they did away with them. And ever since then, we said the rapid... The, it, it, it is astounding. What we see happening right now, that's one of the results of the fact that which is proof positive that the Sabbath is a moral law and perpetual commandment binding all men in all ages. He hath particularly appointed one day in seven for Sabbath to be kept holy unto him, which from the beginning of the world to the resurrection of Christ was so. Now they're dealing with the fact of the per- perpetuity of I think it was a sermon I was reading. The perpetuity and change of the Sabbath, which is interesting, right? Perpetuity. Perpetuity meaning what? Maureen. 
perpetuating. Yeah. It's, 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 no let up. It's, it's not going to stop. Perpetuity and the change. Though the Sabbath was instituted to be a perpetual obligation to the Christian that we worship God uh, <clears throat> during a designated time and yet the change of the Sabbath was what? From what? From the beginning of the world to the resurrection of Christ? Reynolds, start a point in it. Day of the week to be the weekly Sabbath, and the first day of the week ever since to come to be the end of the world, which is the Christian Sabbath. From the Sabbath. beginning of the world to the resurrection of Christ, God appointed the seventh day of the week to be the weekly Sabbath, and the first day of the week ever since, from the beginning of the world to the what? Resurrection of Christ. God appointed the seventh day of the week to be the weekly Sabbath, and the first day of the week ever since. Why the first day of the week ever since? All day. From the beginning of the world to the resurrection of Christ. What day was the Sabbath? It was on the seventh day. And, it, and the first day of the week ever since. Ever since what? Ever since Christ's resurrection. Because, and then why did it change to the first day of the week? Because Christ rose again on the first day of the week. Just so. as God the Father completed the first creation and rested on the seventh day, so Christ rested from the spiritual, the second creation on the first day of the week ever since to continue to the end of the world. Yeah. Was changed into the first day of the week which in scripture is called what? What do you say? Does that begin with an M? Oh. <laughs> M, mine looks like an L. <laughs> We're talking about, maybe that's a Roman maybe that's a Roman numeral to the L. What is that, 50? <laughs> no mine is an L Lord's Day it's called the Lord's Day so what does God think if you call it something else he's not happy about that hey I don't know about you I don't want to make him unhappy <laughs> no. No. well we yearn, we yearn to exalt and glorify him what's that we yearn to exalt and glorify God not man yeah, it's called. So, what do you call this day? You call it the Lord's Day. Are you going to call it something else? Huh? Mother's Super Sunday. We took. We had started out with fifty-two, then fifty-one, then ten little speckled frogs. And then, hey, who knows? Maybe the next one is uh, uh, uh um, um, uh, what? Uh, what is that? Same-sex marriage day. Who knows what they're going to come up with next? But they're subtracting. This church I used to go to called they had a friendship Sunday. There you go. And everybody would get together and eat ice cream. Because <laughs> that was friendly. <laughs> and it's to be continued to the end of the world as the Christians. They don't know, see. They won't listen. But whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, that doesn't influence us. We're going to say it by the grace of God. I mean, when God blesses His people on this day, far be it from us to, to, to call it anything else. Why? Hey, why would you want to call it something? Think about that. The, the, the negative aspects of it, but the positive aspects, why would you want... It's just like we think of, 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 the, of the King James Version. You, In order to begin using a different version, you had to be, you had to be uh, dissatisfied with that. And read... Uh, when I was a kid, the first one of the first things they came out with was the Living Bible. Oh, come on! I mean, seriously, you think that you think that's a Bible? And so, you have to be disappointed, you dissatisfied with calling this day the Lord's Day to call it something else. What, what are we dealing with here, basically? What are we, what are we dealing with? Well, look at the Romans three, the litany. It's, 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 it gets worse and worse and worse. Romans 3, verse 10, As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none to do with good, no, not one. Now, here we go. Their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips. It gets worse and worse whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift 
to shed blood. Not only shed blood, they're swift to shed blood. Look at the look at the, the, the abortion practice. Mm. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. And then the, here's the final, the culmination. There is no fear of God before their eyes. What's the explanation for calling it something? Don't fear God. He calls it the Lord, and you're going to call it something else? You, you're not, we, we're terrified of calling something else. It's like we're terrified of calling certain people who believe the false gospel, right? Calling them a Christian? Suppose God throws that back in your face. How, how on earth could you call this guy a Christian who, who taught over and over and over and over again that the difference between heaven and hell isn't the, isn't the will of God, but it's the will of man? And you call him a Christian? We'd be terrified to do such a thing. Last paragraph. All day. This Sabbath is then kept holy unto the Lord when men, after a due preparing of their hearts and ordering of their common affairs beforehand, do not only observe unholy rest all the day from their own works, words, and thoughts about their worldly employments and recreations, but also are taken up the whole time in the public and private exercises of his worship and in the duties of necessity and mercy. So this speaks about something that we don't normally think of regarding the Sabbath and regarding the worship of God is that if something, what do we, when we, when we, uh, when we do renovations to the house here, what do we do before we get started? We just jump into it. We've got to get everything prepared, right? The paint, etc. You've got to get the brushes. You've got to get the paint. You've got to mix it. You've got to get the tools get ready. The, get the spanker. And yet, something as important as worship. What does it say? When men, after a due preparing of their hearts and ordering of their common affairs beforehand, do not only observe Luther, quiet. So, preparation is an important element of the Sabbath. Do we get enough rest the night before? Or are we corking off during the worship service? Do we know what text is? I remember we were, I really, I really enjoyed that when we were going to a certain church where we knew what the text was going to be and we read in the car it took us about 45 minutes to get there on the way over there we were reading Matthew Henry on that same passage it was an excellent way to get our minds meditating on before we heard the message what 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 does this passage say and then we hear what is what is being preached and then we can compare it with that which we were meditating on beforehand Okay, any other questions? So what were we talking about today, Elizabeth? The, pro huh? the proper um, commandment that God has given us to the worship. Yeah. Uh, isn't it? Yeah. How, how is God to be worshipped? There are two concepts of what is this called? They call it the regulative principle of Worship. There are two concepts of that. Do you remember what they are, Al? There's the correct and the incorrect. See, they, they, I know. they got to have another concept because they don't do this. They don't believe in the regulated principle of worship, but they know they're supposed to. We're talking about the Calvinists here. So what is it? So what is? So what do they say? What's what's another concept of the regulated principle of worship which we don't hold to, but what they say is another possibility. You know what I'm getting at? I know what you're getting at is what the Baptists and the Pentecostals do. What, what is like, that? Uh, let the spirit be led by the Spirit, or something like that. <laughs> well, it's the idea that you can do you you can worship God in any way that you want to, as long as it's not forbidden. Got it? Gotcha. Is that the regular is that what they're talking about? No, 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 no. It must be prescribed. Right. Not forbidden. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we only worship him in the way that he's set down to be worshipped. Mm -hmm. 
They say, well, unless he says, well, then that, what does that open the door to? To, to interpretive dance, to, to plays, to uh, worship leaders up there. Uh, dressed provocatively in all the whole nine yards. Choir. And yeah. Concert. Yeah. Whoever said that? Whoever said that? There's certain people make a joyful noise under the Lord. <laughs> Doesn't say make a professional <laughs> under the Lord. But um, yeah. So God has told us how He is to be. What a, what an appropriate chapter for us to be. Studying at this particular time, right? Here it is. What do we call this day? It's the Lord's Day. Because God has set this day apart from the other six days of the week for His worship and for our benefit. And we always benefit in obedience, right? Look at Deuteronomy 10, 13. Maureen, why don't you read that? Ten thirteen. Right, Deuteronomy ten thirteen. To keep the commandments of the Lord and His statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. There it is. What's what? Why did I ask you to read that? Why do we look at that verse? How is that related? You got it. We keep His commandments that He commands, not our own. And in we, so doing, what do we tend to think as sinners? Just like what we see our kids doing. Well, all right. Right? <laughs> Take the trash out. <laughs> what is that? I did it last time. Huh? Instead of, what an opportunity. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's almost foreign. But <laughs> what does it tell us? God's commands, He commands us to do what he commands us to do for not only for his service but for our good yeah what an amazing and wonderful thing it is when we realize the blessing of the Lord's day and the fellowship that we have with the people of God it's difficult is it not to get together with people knowing and listening to sermons, knowing that the person preaching the sermon doesn't believe the gospel. Hey, how difficult is that? It's difficult. Different. We're in, uh, we're in, uh, we're in difficult times. And so we pray that God would bring his church back to proper worship. Uh, what are the three signs of the church? What's the first sign? Now, the three signs of worship. The three preaching. The three marks. Three the marks of the church. Oh, preaching. The preaching. The pure preaching, preaching of the word, word. Preaching of the true gospel. The sacraments. The administration of the sacraments and the and exercise of church, church discipline. discipline. Let's pray, Heavenly Father. We thank thee for this another Lord's <clears> day. We thank thee for thy word for these men that thou didst raise up. To help us understand what thy word teaches in regard to Christian worship. The, the time for worship and how it is to be carried, about, carried out. And that thou dost command us to worship thee in a certain way. Because that is the way that, that, that tells us what kind of God we do worship. And that thou dost care enough about us to command us to worship thee in such a way as will be honorable unto thee and for our own good. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.